KABC's got another one of these infomercials, and sure enough, the host of the so-called radio show is pushing index annuities, which I destroy in my various YouTube videos. And just like all the other infomercials that you hear, he's presenting straw man arguments, shell games, cherry-picked information, silly anecdotes. And this commercial, I mean, if you listen to it, I'm sure you'll agree, it's presented like it's a, like it's a regular bona fide radio show. Uh, here's a news alert. If you're paying the radio station for airtime instead of the radio station employing you, it's not a radio show. You're, you're, you're not hosting a radio show any more than Vince from Slap Chop is hosting a TV show, okay? So in this radio advertisement, this guy Blair Aronson is puffed up as being a best-selling author, but I'm thinking to myself, I've never heard of this guy. How is this possible? So I did a little research, and if you do an image search for the title of this book, gee, look at all these other people who are also on the cover of this same book. What's going on here? Then I checked out the publisher of this book, and this company will guarantee that your book will automatically become a bestseller. How in the hell does a publisher know in advance that a book will become a bestseller? I mean, do, do they sell the book for one cent and then buy up copies of their own book? Because I, I would love to know. And, and did, did Steve Forbes actually pick and choose who was going to contribute chapters to this book? Or did the publisher decide? And, and did Blair Aronson actually get together with Steve Forbes to write this book? Or did the publisher maybe just acquire rights to use Steve Forbes' words and use his name to sell a book and then charge others who want to pay to be a part of this book? I don't know. I would love to know. But these are all reasonable questions to ask when you see a publisher that miraculously guarantees that you'll become a best seller. And so what about this book, which, which, by the way, reads to me like an underhanded advertisement for his annuity sales business. But putting that aside, Mr. Aronson presents in this chapter he wrote this study, which I think is a great lesson for people on how you can massage a study in order to get self-fulfilling results. He talks about a guy who decides to retire beginning in 1972 with $2 million while taking out 5% per year, and in 20 years, he runs out of money. Well, I plug the numbers into my spreadsheet, and I'm showing that sometime in 1997, four years later, the S&P 500 index ran down to zero. Now, I'm not factoring in expense ratios, but index funds like SPY have expense ratios so low that, that it's minuscule. The S&P still would have lasted until about 1997. Now, I can just hear some annuity salesmen screaming from the mountaintops, well, what about management fees? And this is a typical insurance industry deception. In this day and age, nobody, nobody should be paying 1% per year for an asset manager to hold your hand year after year after year as you simply hold and rebalance two to five index funds. That would be a waste of money because a fifth grader can do that. And heck, you, you don't even need a fifth grader these days. There's self-rebalancing index funds that you can buy. So throw out that argument about asset management fees. So the next thing I noticed about this study, and I've talked about this constantly, and that is, hello, if you're retired or retiring soon, you don't put 100% of your money in stocks. That's absurd. 100% in stocks, that's way over here on the risk return side of the spectrum. So why is he comparing 100% stocks to ice cold annuities? If you put 100% of your money in stocks in retirement and the stock market drops like it did in the 2000s, and all of a sudden the sequence of returns has kicked you in the butt and you're now fighting to get your portfolio back to even, it's not the stock market's fault. It's not Wall Street's fault. It's not the fault of those damn bankers, the, the, the crooks at Goldman Sachs. No, it's your fault for failing to diversify into bonds, age-appropriate diversification. You see how it protected you during the Great Recession and during the Great Depression? But so let's just see what happens if we try some different allocation ratios. First, 50% stocks, 50% 10-year treasuries. 
Well, you ran out of money even sooner in 1993. Okay, well, what about if we choose the lowest risk allocation according to Ibbotson? 28% stocks, 72% bonds. Uh-oh, you ran out of money even sooner in 1991. And if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm leading up to something as critically important as diversification into bonds, and that is... Remember how much money this retiree was taking out per year? 5%? Wait a minute. The experts are saying that you should only be taking out 4%, not 5%. But you're probably thinking, well, what what difference is 1% really going to make? Well, I'm going to show you just how much difference 1% makes per year. And by the way, have you seen this new Prudential commercial where the guy's talking about how if you don't save that extra 1% per year, then you can expect to give up half the things you want to do later in life? And he's right, because look at what happens if we just stick to 4% per year increased with or pegged to inflation, as is recommended by the experts. And lo and behold, by 1997, our portfolio had grown to 105000 and some odd dollars. And, and notice that at a 4% rate of withdrawal, we started taking out $4,128 in year number one, pegged to inflation, then increasing payments each year. By 1997, we're taking out over $16,000. Meanwhile, today's immediate annuity would still be paying fixed income payments for life, but fixed Fixed at what? Well, for a 65-year-old at about 6.264%, $6,264 fixed for life. Then inflation leaves you in the dust. In reality, an annuity that pays fixed guaranteed income for life, you would agree is actually just guaranteed poverty later in life. All because you insisted on having 6.25% right now. I can't live on just 4%. I want my 6% right now right now. Yeah, we'll try living on the inflation-adjusted equivalent of 1.6% at age 91. Try living on $6,264 instead of $16,000. You ever notice how insurance salesmen always omit the word adequate when they say income for life that you can never outlive? They always leave out that operative word. By the way, just for kicks, what would happen if we took a little more risk? 50% stocks, 50% bonds. Well, your portfolio would have grown to $220,618. Wow. Or or how about 100% stocks, just like Blair Aronson's example? Half a million dollars. We literally went from running out of money in 24 years to having half a million dollars in the bank and while taking out $16,000 by 1997. All because you reduced your annual withdrawal rate by 1% per year from 5% to 4%. And this is money that your heirs get to inherit even as you're living comfortably in retirement. With annuities, on the other hand, the way they typically work, by the time you reach somewhere around your life expectancy, there's usually nothing left for your heirs. Or if you get one of these toxic guaranteed income riders, your your death benefit bucket runs out even sooner. So are you understanding my point that 1% makes a huge difference? And that whenever somebody presents a study that looks at a a 5% withdrawal rate, I take it as an attempt to delegitimize traditional investments, and usually it's a ploy to try to sell you some alternative financial product like an annuity. Now, some people will say, well, the 4% rule, we don't know how it's going to hold up in the future. And that leads me to my next point of emphasis. You don't have to stick strictly to the 4% rule. This is an arbitrary line in the sand that can be adjusted. What a novel idea. Just because the 4% rule may start to falter at some point in time, as it did in 1966, which was the worst year in history to begin retirement, as I demonstrated in this video of mine, it doesn't mean that an annuity is even close to being a better deal. 
In fact, in this video of mine, I demonstrated why today's immediate annuity would be a horrible deal by comparison. Yes, clutch your pearls. You had to either ease up on your withdrawals at perhaps about age 75, taking out the same amount of money as the annuity at that point, or you had to take out a consistent 3.4% in order to maintain a reasonable level of principal. Meanwhile, with today's SPIA, you'd be trying to live off 1.28% at age 95. So if 4% makes you feel depressed and inadequate, Try 1.28%. And by the way, immediate annuities are regarded as the least offensive type of annuity out of the bunch, including index annuities. I've also got a ton of videos explaining how index annuities are smoke and mirrors. Uh, a good place to start is this video right here. But so Mr. Aronson was talking about how Tony Robbins has all these great things to say about index annuities. But what he never mentioned is that Tony Robbins is partners with an insurance brokerage company. They're trying to sell annuities. So of course, Tony Robbins is going to say happy things about index annuities. And I actually have a link in the uh, description below this video debunking Tony Robbins' many talking points about index annuities. But what else? Mr. Aronson says, there ain't no fees on an index annuity. This is a shell game. The way these products work is that agent commissions, insurance company overhead and profit is all baked into the product. You're paying indirectly for all these things, whether you know it or not. What else? Mr. Aronson says that index annuities have been bastardized only by people who are fighting for your money. And this is simply not true. I mean, I, I for one, am not selling anything. I'm a consumer advocate. Clark Howard has ripped on index annuities. William Reichenstein, Craig McCann. Furthermore, uh, Mr. Aronson did a little sleight of hand here. Just because someone is fighting for your money doesn't automatically mean that they are biased. I mean, you could, you could describe fee-only fiduciary advisors who work on a one-time basis as people who are fighting for your money. But legally, fee-only advisors not only have to put their clients' interests first, most importantly, they're not legally allowed to earn commissions off of the products they recommend. Fee-only fiduciaries hired on a one-time basis are disinterested in sales commissions because they're not allowed to earn backdoor commissions, and that's a good thing. And isn't Mr. Aronson fighting for your money? Isn't that the purpose of his radio commercials? And if so, how is he somehow unbiased? How does that work?